came from not too far away. I'm just across campus from the Department of Radiology. I'm Director of MRI Research, and, and uh, Dr. Watts got his PhD in, in Physics uh, from York, and then let me see if I can put this all together, then to Grenoble for a postdoc, and then to Sheffield, and then to Cornell Medical College, and now at UVM. Did I get that all? Yeah, I missed one actually. I, I went to New Zealand after. Okay, I and also to New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been around, uh, but, Good we're, job, though. <laughs> but we're happy he's here to tell us about where is the physics in medicine. So thank you very much. And as a small token, you have a little bit. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, usually I give talks to medical audiences, and when I tell them that I'm a physicist, they kind of get a bit scared. But at least in this audience, I feel a hope. And, and my colleagues were saying, oh, you're going back to your spiritual home this afternoon. Mm -hmm. That'll be nice. So that, that's kind of what I feel like. So this is where I work. So this is the MRI scanner that we have on campus. This is a primarily research MRI scanner. So we're not doing patients all the time. We do a few patients on this. Primarily we're doing research subjects. If you're interested in coming over, taking a look at all the, all the cool toys that we've got, please just give me a call. Come over. We can show you what we can do. It's, it's really kind of fun stuff. So I'm going to give a fairly generic talk on where physics comes into modern medicine. So I'm going to concentrate a little bit on, on the MRI side of things because that's my own research area. But I'll talk a bit about where physics has, has applied itself to medicine and, and what we can do with that. So if we're talking about imaging, then if we want to see the inside of the human body, we can just look at the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's fairly clear that in the middle of the spectrum, well, we can't really see inside the body at all. The light waves don't penetrate into the body. But as we go to low frequencies, uh, we get towards radio waves, and radio waves penetrate the body, and radio waves are the basis of the MRI. As we go to high frequencies, we get into X-rays and gamma rays. X-rays and gamma rays can penetrate the body. That's the basis of X-ray imaging, nuclear imaging. Um, radiation therapy is also using these high energy uh, photons, although we can also use particles as well. Actually, in MRI, the, the frequency range that we use is typically between 64 and 128 megahertz. So we're actually on the microwave end of that, that radio frequency spectrum. So one of the concerns that we, we have with MRI is that we start heating people up. That's actually one of our one of our constraints is how much energy we can put into people. And we can have a very big microwave oven if not here. Okay, X-ray imaging. If you went back about 120 years, if you wanted to see inside the human body, the only way that you could do that was to open up the body. You had to cut it open to see what was inside. If you look at the outside of the body, you can't look inside the body. X-ray imaging was developed I was first discovered in 1895, I believe. And it, I mean, it's conceptually very simple that you have an X-ray source, you have an object that you're interested in, you have a detector. The detector in this case is, um, is a screen that absorbs X-rays and emits visible light. And then you have a radiologist who's interpreting the, the image that's being displayed on, on the fluoroscopic screen. So, X-ray imaging hasn't actually moved on that much. Um, it's still the same basis. We still have an X-ray source, we still have an object, we still have a detector. These days we have solid state detectors rather than films or, or fluoroscopic screens. But fundamentally it's the same thing. We have an X-ray source, the X-rays are absorbed preferentially by different parts of the body, and it's the differential X-ray absorption that gives us the image, <coughs> that's giving us the contrast in X-ray imaging. This is actually the very first medical X-ray image, December the 22nd, 1895, <coughs> Wilhelm Röntgen. This, this is the birth of medical imaging. This is the first time you can see inside the human body without opening. This is Rogan's wife. So, I mean, nothing's changed, really. When we do stuff with our MRI scanner, it's like, oh, do you want to go and lie in the scanner? I'll have a look at you. Put your finger in here. We'll try to hit your finger or something like that. We still do the same things. So, Rogan's wife, she put her hand in there. What are you seeing? Well, you're seeing the bone. Because the bone has calcium. Calcium is relatively strongly absorbing of x-rays. That's why it appears dark on her. She's wearing a gold ring. You can see that fairly. 
gold ring, of course, high atomic number material absorbs extra strong. Uh, what else? What has moved on? Well, I mean, this is a modern day X ray. This was a few years ago. Learn something from this X ray. If you're using one of these nail guns that are kind of automatic, don't fall off your ladder. That's kind of a, a bad thing to do. But same X ray absorption here. The iron in these nails gives a strong absorption, so that's what we're seeing there. This builder actually survived perfectly well. That's amazing, isn't it? You can get something like eight nails lodged in his skull and actually not have any major neurological deficits. He was lucky. It's still the same kind of thing. This is a plain film X-ray. Now, one of the things which you notice here is when you look inside the skull there, there's not a lot of contrast. So if we're interested in imaging the brain, the brain tissue itself is this sort of mushy mixture of water and uh, some organic materials. There's not a lot of contrast there. So if you want to image the brain with x-rays, that's going to be kind of tricky. Now, people did come up with some interesting ways around that. Anybody come across pneumoencephalography? So this, this was developed in the 1930s. And I've actually met radiologists who have used this technique. So pneumoencephalography. So the problem is, x-ray absorption of brain tissue is pretty much the same. One tissue is pretty much the same as another. It's almost like water. How can we introduce some contrast into the brain? How do we introduce it? The name gives you a clue here. Pneumoencephalography. Pneumatic? Air. Air. That's right. You inject some air into the cerebrospinal fluid, and you put this air bubble, and you put this air bubble into the brain, and that generates contrast. Because air is, has a different absorption to water, or to brain tissue. Apparently, this gave you the mother of all headaches. <laughs> and the other interesting thing is, how do you make the bubble go in the right place? Yep, that's it. You, you remember these games where you try and get the bubble in the right place by rotating them? You strap your patient to a board and you rotate them around to get the bubble to go in the right place. Very ingenious. Not, not the best for the patient, but very ingenious. Okay, so we move on 20 or 30 years. That, as I say, those techniques were still in use, certainly into the 1960s, I think. How do you get the bubble out? I don't think you do, actually. I think eventually it gets absorbed and the headache goes away. But I, I don't think there's any particular way of removing it, to be honest. I, I, it's a good question. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> You've done the patient the other way. <laughs> Just make a hole somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. Good question. Yeah. I'm sure that maybe they didn't say anything about that. We got a really great image. The patient wasn't so good afterwards. We got a really great image. So we move on to 1967 in terms of X-ray imaging, and this is the dawn of computer tomography, sometimes called CAT scans, computerized axial tomography. Uh, these days we call it computed tomography because an axial section is a section through, through the body in a particular plane. Uh, these days when we get a CT scan, we get such high resolution data that we can look at that data in any plane we want. So it's no longer necessary just to look at the data in an axial plane. And plane. Well, we'll explain a little bit about that shortly. Uh, so the idea behind a CT scan is that if you take a, a standard projection X-ray, but instead of just taking a single X-ray from a, from a single angle, you rotate your X-ray source and your X-ray detector around the patient. You get a whole bunch of projections at different angles. And based on those projections at different angles, you can figure out the three-dimensional structure of the body. I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit. The history is kind of interesting. This was developed by Godfrey Hounsfield at EMI, EMI Labs. And EMI is that radio, is the record company that probably most people have heard of, I guess. Maybe I'm getting old there, am I? Records, you know, 78s and things like that. Um, they actually produced the Beatles records, and the EMI company was extremely successful in terms of their record business, and they put some of that money into research and development, including EMI Labs, and Godfrey Hounsfield developed the first CT scan. So what he realized was that based on a number of projection images, you can figure out the three-dimensional 
aspect of, of a human body. So let me try and explain that. This is what a modern CT scan looks like, by the way. It's a little bit different, but the, the principle is the same. We have an X-ray source, which I would suspect is on this side. We've got an object. In this case, uh, they were looking at the brain already in 1967. They thought, yeah, brain is a good, good object to look at. And then we've got a detector here. In this case, we have a single detector. So it's kind of a slow thing because you have to do a line scan, rotate a little bit, do another line scan, rotate a little bit, do another line scan. This took, I think, maybe 30 minutes to acquire a single slice with a resolution of 64 by 64 pixels. In a modern CT scanner, you get that whole rotation in a fraction of a second. And you get several slices in a fraction of a second. At a resolution more like 512 by 512, something like that. So technology really has moved ahead a lot. So this is the principle behind a CT scan. So if we look at, uh, if we look at the human example, if we, if we can identify an object on two different projections, so we have a projection from the front and we have a projection from the side, if you've got a tumor that you can see in both of those projections and you can identify where it is, you have its three-dimensional location. So two projections is enough in that case. We have the simplified example here, we have an X-ray source, we have an X-ray detector. If we look at the X-ray absorption spectrum, we have a peak in the absorption here corresponding to that location. If we then rotate everything by 90 degrees and we do the same experiment, we get a peak in the absorption there. If we combine that information from those two absorption spectra, we can figure out exactly where that object is. That's fine if you've only got a single object. If you've got multiple objects, you can't solve that problem. You don't have enough information to do it. So the way that you get around that is that you take multiple projections. You don't just take two projections, you might take a hundred, you might take a thousand projections. So let me, let me give you an example of that, and um, I think this gives you a bit more of an intuitive feel for what's going on, if this works. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is going to work. So, this is an experimental CT scanner that we were developing. Uh, this is a mouse, not a human. That's kind of annoying. Let me show it one more time. But when you look at these images, you can appreciate that it's a three-dimensional body. And I mean, your, your eyes can kind of see what's in front of what. So if you can do that, if your brain can figure out where things are in three dimensions based on a whole bunch of projections, then surely we can get a computer to do that. And we can do that. And actually the mathematics of going from projection images to a three-dimensional tomographic slice, that had been figured out a long time ago. That was the radon transform, which I think was several hundred years ago, I believe. I <laughs> So the mathematics of that was well known a long time ago. But what Hounsfield did was to apply that to this particular situation. And what he could generate was a tomographic slice. So let me go back to this. Okay, let me, let me show you what a modern CT scanner looks like. So remember Hounsfield's scanner, I think, took about half an hour to generate a very low resolution single image. Modern CT scanner moves kind of fast. See if I can show this. Okay, so this is just from YouTube, so the quality isn't tremendously good. But you've got an X-ray beam, you've got X-ray detectors all mounted on this rotating gantry here. About how fast that's rotating. It's kind of impressive. If anybody's had a CT scan, you've been right in the middle of that, and you wouldn't really know about it. But yeah, modern CT scan, you can get a complete rotation, and there's a huge amount of weight in this thing. The mass of that, um, the mass of the X-ray tube is huge, and the data throughput is huge. And they have slippery technology so that it remains in contact, so I can send this back to the computer. But it's kind of impressive how fast you can do these things. So now you can image the heart with the CT scan. I mean, the heart is beating, it's moving all the time, and yet we can image fast enough that. Did you have to do any special contrast enhancements for the heart imaging? Uh, for cardiac imaging, they do tend to use contrast. Uh, so they inject uh, an iodine-based contrast imaging. So, I mean, it's x-ray imaging like anything else. The intrinsic contrast in the heart is not tremendously good. I mean, we do, we do quite a bit of non-contrast CT. But I think in the heart, they'll use an intravenous contrast. So you inject that into the veins, it goes to the heart, goes to the lungs, and it goes to everything else. 
Uh, with IV contrast, you don't get a tremendously high concentration, so you don't get a massively strong signal. Uh, for, in some situations, you can use intra-arterial contrast. So they're actually injecting the contrast into the artery, so then it doesn't get diluted so much. So for example, if you're having a carotid MRI, you might do an intra-arterial injection. But yeah, the, the issue with X-ray imaging is that you need a lot of stuff to change the X-ray properties of tissue. Which, and, and this stuff is, is reasonably well tolerated, but it's not, it's not great. You don't want to use it unnecessarily. Okay, so that's CT scanning. What are we on to next? Let's see. Okay. Oh, it did work. Okay, so here are some examples. So, um, certainly these top two examples are with contrast. Obviously, you see bones. I mean, bones give you great contrast on x rays because calcium is is very different from water and other, other body tissues. But if you want to see the blood vessels, you need to help out a little bit. You need to give it, give some contrast here. And say so this is usually an iodine-based contrast. And sometimes use barium in so cases as well. So the contrast agent goes into the blood vessels. In this case, in the top left corner, you're looking at the kidneys there. So from, from a radiological perspective, you might be interested in whether this patient has a problem with their kidneys. Maybe they're uh, maybe they're going to have a transplant, and you you need to know what the anatomy is there. You don't, the surgeon doesn't want to have a surprise when they go into the operating room and you've got an additional renal artery which you didn't know about, or something like that, which happens. There are, there are strange variants in anatomy there. If you've got a bad kidney, is there enough blood supplying it? Is there a stenosis? Is there a blockage in the vessel? If there's a blockage in the vessel, well, maybe we can do something about that. And, I mean, it's amazing what we can do these days in terms of putting in little stents. So, I don't know, people, do people generally come across stents? Do you know what a stent is? Some people do. So a stent is a little mesh, a little metal mesh that holds an artery open. So what they can do is they can put a catheter <coughs> through, through your groin into the artery there, feed it up, and they can take it all the way to your carotid arteries or, or to, your, to the arteries in your heart. And they have this little mesh, and they put it in the right place, and then they pull a string, and essentially it opens up and it supports the artery. And it opens that artery up. So it's kind of amazing that you can do this basically as an outpatient procedure. That you come in, you've got a you've got a blocked artery in your in your heart, and they can just non pretty non-invasively go in and open up that artery and do stuff and help you. That's kind of impressive. So the interventional radiologists do that. Um, yeah, this, I'm not sure what this one was looking at, but it's a nice view of the whole skeleton and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the arterial system showing up there as well. You see kidneys and you see the heart and the lungs, things like that. Uh, this, this, I believe, was an example from a soldier in Iraq who was attacked with a knife. He took a CT scan of this. His, again, his. The outcome was actually quite good. It's amazing what you can get away with. It. You don't, if you spare the really important bits of the brain, you can do an amazing amount of damage and still come out okay. Okay. Let's see. Okay, uh, where are x-rays going? Well, I mean, this, this is still an active area of research, and I worked with a group that were developing new x-ray detectors. So a conventional x-ray detector essentially just detects the total amount of energy that you've put into that detector. So it absorbs all of those x-rays, that energy gets converted into electrical charge, you measure the total amount of charge. What this detector tries to do is not just measure the total amount of charge, but it measures the energies of the individual photons hitting the detector. So if you look at a material, for example iodine, and you look at its its X-ray absorption, it has a very strong peak in its absorption where you start hitting the, the K edge of iodine. There's a particularly strong photoelectric absorption there. If you can image a person and you can separate out different chemicals based on their X-ray absorption spectra, then what you've got is essentially a color X-ray. 
So the color that you were seeing in that previous image, that's just false color. It's not, it's not actually related to any physical property at all. That things are being colored in according to the gross X-ray absorption, not, not chemically selected. The idea behind this is that this detector is energy selective, so we can say these are the photons and this is their energy. And based on the energy, we can work out how much iodine or calcium or water there is in a particular body. So that's kind of cool technology. It has a lot of, there are a lot of issues with that. Uh, it hasn't really made it into production yet, but there are experimental systems in progress. And the, the detector technology was actually part of the developments of CERN. So it's pretty cool that high energy physics gets into all of this stuff as well. How broad is the X ray source? Is it uh, on the whole, it's pretty. Uh, on the whole, it's pretty broad, and in certain applications, it's much less broad. So, for example, in mammography for breast imaging, they use a very low energy beam, and, and they have a fairly narrow spectrum there. But for a lot of the imaging that we do, it's pretty broad spectrum. Really. We're usually looking at the range 50 to 100 kV, somewhere around there, for, for general kind of chest imaging. Um, it, yeah, it's a it's a broad spectrum. There are some you can do things to make it a, a much tighter spectrum. Uh, it's Bremsstrahl and, and uh, another mechanism whose name I've forgotten. <laughs> uh, characteristic X-rays. So you can hone in on, on those characteristic X-rays and you can filter the spectrum to, to make it a lot tighter if you want to. And that's that's actually done in the same breast imaging. You really want a very narrow beam, narrow spectrum, because you, you have a thin tissue and you really want to maximize the contrast there, and that's the way that you do it. So there's, there's applications engineering there. It's, um, there is a lot of engineering. Um, so that's, that's X ray imaging. So we have an X ray source. And nuclear imaging is, a, is another way of imaging the human body. And in this case, we the thing that's generating the radiation is something that we're injecting into the patient. So we inject a radioactive source into the patient. Uh, if you have something like a tumor, tumors tend to be highly vascularized. They suck up a lot of blood. So they will suck up whatever you inject into the blood. So if you've got a tumor, it'll light up. And you, you can do some clever chemistry and biochemistry to try and get your radioactive source to target particular molecules so it, goes, so it becomes more specific. So if, you, if you're emitting gamma rays from a radioactive source, how do you generate an image from that? Now, what I would really want somebody to develop is a gamma ray lens. If somebody could just give me a gamma ray lens, I could just sit the patient there, put a lens there, get an image on my photographic plate over here. That would be ideal. I would love somebody to build an X-ray lens or a gamma ray lens. Unfortunately, we can't do that, so we're left with a really inefficient system, which is called an anger camera or a gamma camera. There's a guy called Hal Anger. So the anger camera is just based on a lead collimator. So this is this is a sheet of lead with lots and lots of little holes in it. So because the hole, because the holes have a certain depth, only gamma rays going in a particular direction will go through the holes in the detector. So you can have a parallel beam collimator there. So essentially, if you if you detect a gamma ray in your detector here, then it must have come from straight along this line here. It has to go straight through the collimator, otherwise it would be up to This is incredibly inefficient. I mean, only one in maybe 10,000 gamma rays is actually detected. That's why I want to get a ray lens, but I just give me gamma ray lens. Never mind. That's very simple technology. So this this is a gamma. Uh, just, I mean, I, I try to throw in some different bits of physics here. When you look at radioactive half-lives, nature is, is kind to us in radioactive half-lives. If we're giving somebody a dose of radioactive material, we don't want materials that decay in half a second, or less than half a second. Because by the time we've injected them, they've decayed, it's gone. No good. That doesn't work. We don't want materials with half, which have half-lives of 50 years or more. That's no good, because we're going to do our imaging exam and they're still going to be radioactive for the rest of their lives. That's not going to be a lot of use, is it? So we have this small window where we want those half-lives to be. And 
The one that's used a lot in the, in the nuclear imaging is technetium-99. So technetium-99, it's, it's kind of nice. The, so if you do nuclear fission, and you, you generate byproducts of that nuclear fission. So if you break up uranium-235, you get all kinds of different byproducts. One of the byproducts is molybdenum-99. And you can just separate out that from, from the other materials from your nuclear reactor. Molybdenum-99 itself decays to technetium-99N. So this is a metastable state of technetium. And that decays with a half-life of 67 hours. So that's kind of nice. So you can go to your nuclear reactor, you can take your molybdenum from this nuclear reactor, you can ship it around the world, get it somewhere, wait for it to decay to technetium-99M, filter that off, and you can use chemical means to filter the technetium away from the molybdenum. And then that technetium you can inject into a person, it has a half-life of six hours, so the person comes in for their scan in the morning, by the following day, essentially, they've gone through four half-lives. It's gone. The radioactive, the radioactivity has gone down by a factor of two to the power of four. It's gone down, down by sixteen. It's going to decay away quite rapidly. So you don't actually need to be on site for the nuclear reactor to generate this technetium nitride. It's kind of cool technology that nature is kind. That the parent has a long half-life, a reasonably long half-life, <coughs> and the daughter has a short half-life. Uh, the, the decay of the technetium is also nice, it's an isomeric transition, which means it's just a rearrangement of the nucleus that releases the gamma ray. Gamma rays are good for this, we don't like generating um, charged particles because that's going to do damage to people. Charged particles are not good, gamma rays are okay because they get out of the body on the whole. So nature is kind to us. There are other materials. Okay, so this is called sync. Oh, so that's nuclear imaging. We can have a three-dimensional equivalent of that. So we can do plain film nuclear imaging, as we were just looking at with an anger camera or with a uh, nuclear camera. We can do three-dimensional imaging with the same technology. All we need to do is to have a set of detectors and rotate those detectors around the patient. It's exactly the same principle as the CT scan. This gives us three-dimensional data. This is called SPECT, Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography. Why do we have to call it Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography? What might the alternative to Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography be? Multi-photon, good. Good guess, yes. Two-photon, essentially. <laughs> This is PET. Okay, so again, this is this is cool. I like this because this is kind of Star Trek physics and stuff. It's really like right, these are positrons. These are anti-electrons. So you can generate materials which decay by positron emission. A positron is an anti-electron. What happens when a positron meets an electron? Which it's going to do? Everybody knows this from Star Trek. It's a warp drive or whatever. What happens when? Antimatter and matter meet. They annihilate each other. So they annihilate each other. They disappear out of existence. What happens to the energy of that? The electron has a certain rest mass, the positron has the same rest mass. That mass is equivalent to energy. Where's that energy going to go? What does it get converted into? A photon of light. It has to generate two photons of light. If I've got an electron and a positron, and they're both basically stationary, and they decay, why can't they just emit one photon of light? Conservation of momentum. Conservation of momentum, absolutely right. Yeah, the photon has momentum. If you can't generate a single photon. If you've got no momentum to start off with, you can't generate a single photon. Excellent answer. I used to give out chocolates when I was teaching. <laughs> I did bring, sorry, I did bring one. So you have to generate two photons. And if one photon is going in this direction, what direction is the other photon going in? Has to go in the opposite direction, doesn't it? To conserve momentum. So positron emission, now positron, positron electron annihilation. Now you have two photons generated in the same event at the same time. 
going in opposite directions. If I have detectors and I detect those two photons at the same time, then I know that that annihilation event happened on a line connecting those two detectors. Those two detectors. That's positron emission tomography. Yeah. Do you really only do a slice, or do you have a tube they, and get them at yeah, a range they, of angles? They have, a, they have several rings of detectors, but not a complete. I mean, you would kind of want a three-dimensional sphere around there, but we, we don't have it. Uh, this the the standard material that we use for PET is. Fluorine 18, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, which is basically a sugar analog, so it goes where the sugar goes in the body. That's kind of nice. That has a half-life of two hours, which is very convenient to us. But you do have to generate that with a cyclotron. So, so how exactly are positrons inserted in the body? Uh, so this fluorine 18 is a positron emitter, which is attached to a sugar molecule, and you inject sugar into the bloodstream. It's just a tiny little amount of sugar. I mean, the, the chemistry, the wet chemistry is kind of cool. You can have a cyclotron, and within seconds, if you need to, you can generate material and inject it into people. You don't have to do it within seconds for FDG, but there are other radioactive materials which we use, which have half-lives measured in seconds rather than hours. You can do those, if you have a cyclotron. Now, uh, this paper came out in 1973, which sounds a little bit obscure. Image formation by induced local interactions, examples employing nuclear magnetic resonance. Why might this be important? Mm -hmm. Probably more important than island lizards, the genetic, genetic variation correlation. <laughs> this one got a Nobel Prize. I don't think that one did. This is MRI. This is the development of MRI. This is Paul Latibus paper from 1973. Uh, Peter, Peter Mansfield in Nottingham in Britain came up with another paper in 1973, NMR diffraction in solids. Again, sounds obscure, but it was enough to win Latibus and Mansfield a Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2003. This was the basis of MRI. And there's a quote here from Niels Bohr, I think it really kind of sums it up, and you think it's kind of glib, but actually there's a lot of truth to it. You know what these people do is really clever. They put little spies into molecules and send radio signals to them. And then they have to radio back what they're seeing. Okay, that sounds a bit stupid. <laughs> but actually, you think about this, and you think what these things are, are representing, it actually makes sense. Which are the hydrogen nuclei. These are the spies in the molecules. Is the hydrogen nucleus, the proton, the center of a hydrogen atom. These are aligned by a big magnetic field. This is our magnetic field. This is our MRI scan. The field strength is 3 tesla. That's about 30,000 times the Earth's magnetic field. That is a huge, huge magnetic field. Um, you need to be very careful with such big fields. The forces that they can generate are huge. If I saw there was a YouTube example where they, they were playing with one of these scanners and they had a chair attached, I mean, the chair had been pulled into the scanner, and the forces involved were about 2,000 pounds of force to pull this chair off the scanner. It's a very strong magnetic field. You can do some really cool physics with this as well if you want to play with it. If you put hydrogen nuclei into a magnetic field, they resonate. They have a resonant frequency, nuclear magnetic resonance, and this resonant frequency is proportional to the magnetic field strength. The omega, the resonant frequency, is proportional to B. Gamma is the gyromagnetic ratio. It's a constant for, for hydrogen nuclei. It's 42 megahertz per tesla, which means in a 3 tesla field, the resonant frequency is about 128 megahertz. So what happens is, you have a resonant frequency. If you send in radio waves that are at that resonant frequency, they'll get absorbed, and then the, that energy will get re-emitted, and that's the signal that you're measuring. Now, that's all very well. That's nuclear magnetic resonance. How do we do imaging? What was Latimer and Mansfield's great idea? And it's a very simple idea. Very simple idea was, instead of doing an NMR experiment where you make the field as uniform as you cost as you possibly can to get the strongest possible signal, make the field non-uniform. If you make the field spatially varying, then the resonant frequency is spatially varying. 
So then if you send in a signal at a particular frequency, it will, go, it will be resonantly absorbed at a particular location. When you listen to the signal coming back, and you hear a signal at a particular frequency, you can say, oh, that frequency corresponds to that location. That's the magical thing. That's basically what Latimer and Mansfield got the Nobel Prize for. It's to say, if you make the magnetic field a function of spatial location, you make the resonant frequency a function of spatial location, and we can measure the resonant frequency so we can measure the location. Really simple, at least, I don't know, I've been in this field a while. <laughs> Maybe it's not that simple, but that's, that was the idea. Use magnetic field gradients to make linear variations in the magnetic field strength. Yeah. How do they get 3D images? You need three sets of gradient coils. Okay. And you need to do this cleverly oh, in terms oh, of when you're, when you're sending the radio wave in, you use one magnetic field. And then when you're receiving a signal back, you switch the magnetic fields and you can get information that way. That's not a great explanation. No, that's that's too important. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's. That's two dimensions. Three dimensions yeah. is a little bit more tricky, but basically that's the case. Yeah. How big is the gradient? So it's a three Tesla field and you're varying um, it by... The gradient strength is... What are we on? Um, I'm trying to think of the appropriate units. Uh, 40 millitesla per meter is our gradient strength. So it, it's weak compared with the main magnetic field but it's still pretty strong. We, we end up putting uh, about 20 amps through our gradient coils, and we can switch that 20 amps with a very high degree of accuracy in much less than a millisecond, which is kind of cool. There's a lot of impressive engineering here. How do you generate a three Tesla magnet? Use superconducting coils. We have three or 400 <coughs> miles of superconducting coils. We have 2,000 liters of liquid helium making a superconducting. It's all kind of cool physics, is Ah. The magical thing about MRI is not just the, the fact that we can generate images, but we can manipulate the contrast in our images. So we can generate images which are sensitive to different properties of the tissue. The most basic contrast we would call proton density. How many hydrogen nuclei do we have? If we've got more nuclei, we're going to get more signal. That's fine. We have magnetic relaxation times. So when you send this radio wave in, the signal doesn't doesn't stay at a constant amplitude as it's coming back, it decays away over time, and that decay depends on a couple of physical mechanisms, uh, imaginatively called T1 and T2. These properties are very different for different tissue types, so by changing how we acquire our data, this is purely in software, this is, this is just changing the timing of our data acquisition. We can go from, from an image that, yeah, yeah maybe I do. From an image that looks like this, we'd call this a T1 weighted image. The fluid here, this is the, these are the ventricles of the brain, are a bit dark on a T1 weighted image. We have reasonably strong contrast between the white matter, which is bright here, and you can see this little, little edge around the brain, that's the gray matter. It's about three millimeters of cortex, that's the, that's the gray matter. So we have good white gray contrast, don't see fluid in that image. In a T2 weighted image, we see the fluid as being very bright. So you've got fluid around, surrounding the brain, fluid inside the brain. And we can determine what things are. You can see the fluid in the eyeball as well. There are other cases where we want to see this type of image, and we like some of the things about this contrast, but we don't actually want to see the fluid, so we can suppress the fluid. Uh, we can look at physical properties of the tissue. This, this is called diffusion tensor imaging, or diffusion MRI. We can make our MRI scan sensitive to how water is moving within the brain. We'll talk about that in a little bit. This is what people come across a lot in in the popular press, functional MRI, which part of your brain lights up when you're thinking of what you're going to have for lunch or whatever else. We can look at that with our MRI scanner. We can look at blood flow. This is a quantitative perfusion map. This is MR angiography. This is looking at blood vessels. This is all with exactly the same scanner. We haven't changed any hardware. We've just changed how we acquire our data. So MRI is kind of unique in the flexibility that we have there. I've got to give you three-dimensional data. Yeah, we work in a visual field. It's, some people find this a little bit disturbing. I, mean, <laughs> I find it disturbing, but the primary reason for that is that this is my father who visited, thrown into the scanner. So it's like, eh, yeah, <laughs> that's why it's disturbing to me. <laughs> it's safe. 
That's fine. I'm sure it's safe. I told you it was safe. <laughs> okay. He's perfectly fine. He's very well. <laughs> okay, functional MRI. I'm just going to talk about a couple of areas. I know I'm running a little bit short on time here. So functional MRI appears in the press all, in all kinds of places. So obsessive compulsive disorder, can we understand that? Uh, what about... Oh, why can some people not resist food? So you can lie in an MRI scanner and they show you pictures of chocolate cake and see that's a great We can do that. Uh, this is good, seeing the teenager in the brain. If you've got, if you've got kids at home, bad news is adolescent brain undergoes massive changes and doesn't reach maturity until 20 or 30 years old. I think it could be related to that, actually. Uh, this is more, I mean, this is more important, uh, vegetative patients, so patients who can't communicate, you can talk to those patients and ask them to imagine themselves playing tennis. And in some cases you see brain changes that make sense in terms of other people imagining themselves playing tennis or doing some other tennis. So it's a way of communicating to patients who cannot move one muscle. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, brain scan can read your mind. That's, yep, we're getting into the sci-fi of it here. This is all, I mean, this is a new field. This is neuroeconomics, <laughs> which is uh, using neuroimaging to try, to try to sell your product. That's kind of good. So how does this stuff work? Well, again, there's some good physics involved. Magnetic properties and structure of hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, and carbon monoxyhemoglobin. Minus polar. 1936, and then he refers to Michael Faraday in 1845, uh, looking at some magnetic properties of blood, and said, well, this discovery without doubt would have excited much interest and would have influenced appreciably the course of research on blood and hemoglobin. So, what did they find out? They found out that oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood have different magnetic properties. Is that kind of interesting for us? If Oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood have different magnetic properties. If we're imaging the brain with our MRI scanner, we're blatantly sensitive to magnetic properties of things. So then if you do a task, your neurons are firing. In response to your neurons firing, the brain supplies more blood. The brain changes the blood oxygenation. You get a local change in the blood oxygenation in relation to what you're doing neuronally. It's an indirect measure, but it's, it's a measure. This is called this is, um, imaging language, so we can ask people to listen to a passage of text and see what parts of the brain activate. And the nice thing is the, the background to this, the, the water test. So if, if you're unfortunate enough to have a tumor, and the surgeon wants to know which side of your brain language is based on, because language tends to be on one side or the other, the old way of doing this is called the water test. You put one half of the brain to sleep and you see if you can still talk and listen. So you inject um, anobarbital into one carotid artery, you essentially anesthetize one half of the brain. And if you can still understand language and talk, then that's not the half of the brain that is language. This is a much better way of doing this. Okay, another application of MRI, uh, connectomes. This is popular these days. This is a great book, the one in the middle here, Sebastian Sun. Connectomes, connections within your brain. Uh, the idea here is that if you know, essentially everything about you is encoded within connections within the brain. All of your memories, <coughs> everything that makes you a unique individual is encoded by the strengths of different connections. If we could measure every single connection in your brain, the hypothesis goes we'd know essentially everything about you. We can't measure every single connection, but it's, that's where we're heading towards. And maybe in certain disorders, there are connections which haven't formed properly, or perhaps connections which are too strong. And we can do that using MRI, and we use diffusion MRI. So we can make our MRI scanner sensitive to Brownian motion, to, to diffusion. So what we're looking at in the brain is called water self-diffusion. It's water moving around within a matrix of water, essentially. But it's still moving, and we can measure that motion. It's driven by the temperature. And again, nature is kind to us. When you look at the measurement time that we have, which is typically of the order of 10 to 100 milliseconds, water molecules in that period of time move by between 10 and 40 microns. 
That distance scale is just right for probing cells, because that's the sizes of cells. Okay. Why is this useful? This is an example of a patient who has a stroke. What happens in a stroke? In a stroke, you cut off the blood supply. You have all these cells which are working hard. Suddenly, they don't have any food. So they stop working. One of the things that happens is that the pumps that the iron pumps that keeps the cell in equilibrium stops working. And what you end up with is a huge shift of water into the cells. So you get this osmotic pressure that pushes the water into the cells. That means that we suddenly have a lot of intracellular water and not much extracellular water. That water that's inside the cells doesn't move around much, has very different diffusion properties. That's that big white chunk there. That's the tissue that's being killed by the stroke. It's a very sensitive technique. But diffusion is also sensitive to, to other things as well. I mean, we can look at head injuries, for example, and that's one of the big issues at the moment. We can look at neuronal disease like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. We can look at cancers. We can look at development. What happens during myelination with children uh, as children develop? Their, their axons become myelinated, they become insulated. And we can look at that. We can do some very fancy maths on this stuff. And we can, this is actually looking at white matter tracts within the brain, connections from one part of the brain to another. And we can map these things out. We can even look at parts of the brain where you have two bunches of fibers crossing each other. This, this is kind of, kind of interesting and becomes very challenging mathematically. So if, you, if you're really into this kind of stuff, this is spherical deconvolution is the, is the term of what we do here. And it's really kind of complicated mathematically. So if somebody would like to explain that to me, really, really happy. But, uh, it's a long time since I did that. So. Uh, so then we can do fiber tracking, we can look at connections within the brain. Uh, well, that's a very brief introduction. To life. I'm trying to finish my final class. That's why I'm going past it. Going past it. MRI is safe, so we can do cool things like this. We imaged four-week-old babies. MRI is safe. There's no ionizing radiation involved. As far as we know, there are no long-term side effects of MRI. Never know what people might find in the future, but on the other hand, the, uh, the frequencies that we're using are similar to your cell phone. So if you're worried about your cell phone, yeah, you worry about an MRI scan, you can worry about that. Generally safe, unless you have some issues. I told you it was a strong magnetic field. These are the kinds of accidents that do unfortunately happen. Uh, anything will get sucked into that strong magnetic field. Uh, a few years ago, there was a child killed at Westchester Medical Center by an oxygen tank that was brought into the room and essentially it flew as a projectile and killed the kid. Uh, this, this is not that kind of danger. What danger is this? Do you recognize what this is? It's a tiger. Well, I mean, why not? Use your MRI scan and get a tiger. I know that's still dangerous. Come on. Okay. I've got past imaging now. I've just talked very briefly about radiation therapy. So, imaging is great. That's what I do all the time. I have colleagues in the hospital who do radiation therapy for a living. And this, this is actually where the majority of medical physicists are employed in hospitals. Is for radiation therapy. So, the idea here is that if you're unfortunate enough to have a tumor, then you can kill that tumor with radiation. But what you need to do is to minimize the radiation dose to the healthy tissue because that's going to cause the side effects. Okay, so you need to you need to keep the dose in this range when you control the tumor, but you minimize the complications. So how do we do that? And this, I mean, it's again, it sounds really kind of simple, but in practice, it's very difficult to do. Uh, intensity modulated radiation therapy. So. Like with a CT scan, if you have your radiation source and you point it at the tumor, you'll give the tumor a good dose of radiation, but you'll give the healthy tissue an equally good dose of radiation. But what about if you then rotate your source around the patient, so you're always pointing at the tumor? So the tumor then gets all of the radiation, whereas the remaining radiation gets spread more evenly across the healthy tissue. So you're then keeping the healthy tissue within that, that safety zone, while giving a high dose to the tumor. Now, not only can you do that, but you can then vary the intensity of that radiation, and you can do that with little lead collimators that you move in and out of the deep. So this is the intensity modulation. So the idea here is that the blue thing is the tumor, the green might be the spinal cord. You want to minimize the dose to the spinal cord, that's going to be a problem to the patient. 
So by rotating your, your radiation source around the patient, and by modulating its intensity, you can, you can maximize the dose to the tumor and minimize the dose to the surrounding health and tissue. Again, this is, this is kind of cool. Yeah, I wanted it sooner. Okay, go away. Go away. So this, this is a linear accelerator that generates a radiation source that then is applied to the patient. It's amazing how much weight there is in this thing that's rotating around the patient. This is, I mean, this kind of reminds me of like Robocop or something like that. It's really kind of cool technology. So you're the patient, you're lying on a bed in the middle of that. There's actually some, some imaging built in as well. I think two of the arms are related to imaging, so you can keep an eye on the patient. So you can maximize the dose to the patient. And there's an awful lot of work in trying to generate the optimum treatment plan for a given patient. So this is the tumor. This is what we want to kill. But be very careful of this bit and be careful of this bit. Well, we can allow a little bit more radiation here. Those organs are not quite so sensitive. And you can do Monte Carlo simulations. And there's a lot of software that's come out of high energy physics that can be used for Monte Carlo simulations to do those kind of dose calculations. Dose calculations. So this is where an oncologist would work with a medical physicist to generate the optimum, or what we think is the optimum dose distribution. So, just summarizing, yeah, five and five on the five. So I think physics has made amazing contributions to modern medicine. I mean, the radiology department wouldn't exist without the things that we've done. X-ray imaging is still in use today. I mean, we do huge numbers of just plain film imaging. We do CT scans all the time. We do fluoroscopy. So if, you, if you're putting in a stent or something, you need to be able to see what you're doing. You're doing real-time X-ray imaging to see where your catheter is, making sure that you're putting the stent in the right place. Nuclear imaging, SPECT, PET, MRI is amazingly flexible. So I, I, could, I could talk all afternoon about MRI, so I'm not going to do that. Radiation therapy. This is not my specialist area, but this is an area that is huge for physicists to work in. Um, there's an awful lot more to be done, and we really, if anybody's interested in getting involved in medical physics, it's a, it's a great place to be. I think it's, very, it's a very rewarding career. So let me just thank uh, my, the other people who work in the lab, Jay Garnier, Scott Hipko, a technologist, Trevor Andrews is another physicist, that's me, and um, thank you for your attention. Do you see x-ray going away, or is it going to be completely replaced by MRI and, and other things, or no, is it I here think to in, in a lot of applications, I mean MRI, you have, first of all, if, you, um, if you're uncertain about your patient, don't put them into an MRI scanner because you don't know what's inside them. So if they got a nail to the head, you don't want to put them into That's an MRI scanner. That's right. I mean, even if, you, <laughs> even if you've been in a car, absolutely. Even if you've been in a car accident or something like that, if you're not conscious, if you can't say, I'm safe to go to the MRI scanner. I don't know whether you've got a pacemaker. If I put you in that MRI scanner and you've got a pacemaker and you're reliant on it, the outcome's not going to be good. CT is fast. MRI is slow. MRI scans take typically five minutes per set of images that we apply, but we do require lots and lots of sets of images. So they're, they're complementary. Cardiac imaging with MRI is really, really tough. Um, just because of the movement, you have respiratory motion as well as cardiac motion. I don't think CT is going away. Uh, CT dose reduction is becoming more important now. So the way that you reconstruct your image, there are iterative reconstruction methods which are much more efficient. You need many less photons to generate the same image. But these are very complicated, very slow reconstruction methods. But that's one of the things which we've got in the last couple of years here is some dose reduction software that essentially you can get the same image with a third of the, the X-ray dose. Yep. So what is the te temporal uh, resolution for MRI? Yeah. For MRI, when, when we're doing structural imaging, when we want to see fine structures, it might be five minutes for a scan and the spatial resolution would be maybe a little bit better than a millimeter. No, I mean temporal. Temporal resolution, when we're doing functional MRI, we get down to about two seconds. So we can get a whole volume in two seconds or so. So it's, it's 
actually is the average value of in two seconds. Yes. Yes. So that's I mean that's that's slowly compared to yeah. NMR is a weak signal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if anybody has to rush off by the way, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I know it's after five o'clock. So yeah, uh, how about cost? That I can't. That I don't know about, actually. Because okay, there are advantages and disadvantages in what you can see and not see. But yeah, uh, if one costs a thousand times more than oh, the X-ray. Oh, sorry, no, sorry, cost. Oh, oh yes, I COST. COST. Okay, cost uh, three Tesla MRI machine costs about three million dollars. Oh. CT scanner might be half a million to a million dollars. PET scanner, one or two million dollars. If you need a cyclotron, that's another few million dollars. Um, it's in that it's in that sort of half a million dollar to several million dollar range. Mm -hmm. uh, a cheap MRI scanner might be a million dollars, but actually the facility cost is quite high because you have to have a shielded mm -hmm. room. And yeah. So you're almost talking about the same amount for the facility as, as for the scanner itself. So cost. It's um, the problem is that radiologists want the best possible image. We could make a cheap MRI scanner. And in fact, people have made relatively inexpensive MRI scanners. But if you're a radiologist, you're not going to like looking at those images. So they always want the best possible image. Which is, I mean, that's good for patient care, but it, you pay for it. Absolutely. Yeah. This may be proprietary information, but I was just curious about the detector that you showed, the prototype. Yeah. And spectrally resolves the, yeah. the, yeah. the beam, right? Uh, yeah. What's, I mean, the, what's the, the actual principle? So how does it work? Do you bias the, each pixel differently, or how do you do the spectral? How do you resolve it's a, the, the energy? So at each pixel, you have a charge-sensitive amplifier. So if you've got a 256 by 256 array, you've got essentially 65,000 individual charge sensitive detectors. And that just streams all of that data to, to the computer. It's not, I mean, it's not amazingly sophisticated. It's a silicon layer. You have a bias voltage that, that makes the charge go as far as possible straight through the detector. The problem is that the charge tends to spread out a bit in one of the pixels, so it's not, it's not ideal. But, I mean, it's not proprietary. This, uh, if you look at Medipix, that's just one of these charge sensitive detectors and, and it's a result of the, the development of CERN. So there's a lot of I mean while they, they are making this as kind of a product, <coughs> it's come out of an academic lab and they, they're published on the on the basic physics of it. The difficulty is when you go beyond silicon. So silicon isn't a great material because you would have to have a very thick layer of silicon to detect the photon energies that we're actually interested in. So then they move to other materials, but then those are less compatible with the electronics. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's difficult. Time but of course, everything has to be very fast. Time for one more question, maybe, if there are any. Yeah. What creates the uh, gaps in the detection? Is that gasly noise? Oh, OK, OK, good <laughs> question. OK. Yeah, okay, anybody who's had an MRI scan, they are incredibly noisy. Actually, our scanner, we can easily hit 130 decibels, which is very, very noisy. There are no moving parts in our MRI scanner. No moving parts. Okay, what do we have in an MRI scanner? We have a big magnetic field, and we have three gradient coils. And we switch current through these three gradient coils, and we switch that current very rapidly through the three gradient coils. What happens when you put a current through a wire in a magnetic field? Shocks. What do you generate? Vibrations. You generate a Lorentz force. That's what you're hearing in your MRI scanner, is the wires Static rattling around like this. Those forces are huge. Yes. Because you have, you're switching 20 amps in a millisecond, and it's sat in a 3 tesla magnetic field. Forces are enormous. <laughs> And that's the noise. There are no moving parts. Oh. Not intentionally. And we try to minimize them. <laughs> so do the parts fracture over a short period of time? Uh, they don't. The coils, I mean, these coils are just made out of copper and they're very thick coils. I wish I had a photograph of the, they have these fingerprint coils. They're, 
very interesting technology. They do give up occasionally. That's true. But yeah, it's this whole thing rattling around. It's <laughs> when you're switching large currents very rapidly in a strong magnetic field, you generate huge alternating forces, and that's what causes the noise. With that, thank you very much.